kingdom of God in the future. The kingdom of God is very much a topic that encompasses the whole Bible. It's, it's essentially the, the reason why God wrote the Bible, so that us, his creation, might learn about him and his plan and his purpose. So, as you can imagine, there's, as it's throughout the Bible, we'll be turning up many passages, or, or hopefully I have most of them on the screen for you. Um, so, if you can't keep up, that's fair enough, uh, but we will be going to a fair few tonight. So let's just quickly go over what we covered um, last week as a continuation. So we first of all started with an overview of the history of the nation of Israel as a kingdom, looking back um, to the time when it was set up um, through Abraham. We had the 12 tribes of Israel, went to Egypt, the nation was brought out of Egypt, then they had their um, judges and their kings period, um, then they're taken away by Babylon into captivity, then by the Romans, and then all the way through to 1948, where Israel is on a map, as you'll see today. We also looked at the start of God's kingdom, which essentially began with the promises to Abraham that were magnified in David and then were to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, this evening, we're very much going to be looking at the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. But as kind of a recap of what these promises were that were made to Abraham and David, we have the promises in Genesis chapter 12, where it says the Lord said to Abram to get the Adai country from your kindred and to a father's house to a land that I will show thee. So we started off with a land and said that it would make you a great nation. So we've got those, the land and the nation part, which essentially is what kingdom is kind of about. And it says that I'll bless you and make your name great so that your name shall be a blessing. I'll bless them that bless you, curse them that curse thee. And in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. And as we saw with the history of the nation of Israel, that was partially um, fulfilled back in Genesis when Abraham had the 12 tribes of Israel, which turned into a great nation that almost threatened the Egyptians, and then God brought them out into their own land in Canaan. These promises are then magnified in David. So there, uh, we looked at 2 Samuel chapter 7, how God made the same promises. Talking to David, he says, I took you from the pasture from following the sheep, that you should be a prince over my people Israel. And then later on in verse 9, that I'll make you a great name, very much similar language to the promises made to Abraham, um, that your name will be one of the great ones in the earth. And verse 10, that I will appoint you a place for my people, for my people Israel, and will plant them in the land, so they may dwell in their own place with no disturbance anymore. Um, verse 13, we saw that um, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So these are all echoes that we're going to see throughout tonight um, as, as we go through the kingdom of God to happen in the future. So the kingdom of God in the past, we, we, we also looked at why the children of Israel were chosen, because this is, again, fundamental to, to looking forward. So let's just kind of recap it. Um, we have the verse Deuteronomy 7, verse 6 on the screen that, that essentially says, For you are a people holy, Holy being separate unto the Lord your God. For the Lord your God has chosen you. He's chosen you to be a people as a treasured possession out of all people on the face of the earth. And it wasn't because, as it goes on to say, it wasn't that you're more in number than any other people, that he loved you or chose you more than others. For you are fewest of all people. But it's because the Lord loved you and in keeping the oath or the promise that he swore unto their fathers, those fathers being Abraham and David. Um, and then it actually goes later on to say that he is the faithful God who keeps his covenants, so reiterating and his steadfast love to those that love him and keep his commandments even unto a thousand generations. And then I think we've actually finished the evening on this verse, the promise of the future kingdom to come, which is our topic tonight. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, that very much taken out of context, Daniel chapter 2, being Nebuchadnezzar's image, we have the head of gold all the way through down to the feet of iron and clay, which is today's day, and it's in the days of these kings that the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. We've got the same language again here that his kingdom lasting forever, that the God of heaven will establish this kingdom, which is the same as the promises he made to Abraham. So with very much crash course of what we did last week, uh, let's go through what we're going to cover, uh, cover for tonight. So 
once again, I'm going to lay some foundational beliefs that we can kind of springboard into um, as a uh, taken knowledge. And then we'll go through the purpose of the kingdom of God. I mean, God will send up, set up a kingdom, but why? What is the purpose behind it? Then we're going to look at Jesus, Christ, Jesus Christ's return to the earth and then the resurrection of the dead. Uh, as we've looked at the nation of Israel's involvement in the past, we're very much going to look at the nation of Israel's involvement in the future. And then, as we're not just looking at the nation of Israel, we might just briefly mention the rest of the nations involved. And then what we'll spend a bulk of tonight looking at is what the established kingdom of God will look like. So, just something that um, we can all agree on uh, from foundational beliefs that we'll need for the rest of the night. So, first and foremost, it goes without saying that the Bible is the only source of knowledge that the God has provided for man to know and learn and come to understand about his plan and purpose with the earth. We, we don't believe in any um, humans who are um, in contact with God that get messages from God in, in today's day. There's no other uh, manuscripts or anything out there that otherwise indicate of God's plan and purpose, but the Bible is the only book that we can learn from him. In 2 T Timothy 3, verse 16, um, it says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And that in idea of um, the scripture being inspired, the inspiration of God is the idea of God breathes, that God caused it to be written down. So the Bible is the only source of knowledge of God. And the second one we want to state is that God is involved with the earth today, and he uses the free will of people to bring about his purpose. Uh, the verse we had there, Daniel 4, verse 17, halfway through, it says that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men. He gives it to whomsoever he will, and he setteth up even the basis of men. He uses people's choice, their own free will, to go, okay, God wants this to happen, he, to create his plan and his purpose on the earth, and he uses people in today, even today, to bring about the kingdom of God in the future. Thirdly, that God has appointed a day in which he will send the Lord Jesus Christ to set up the kingdom of God. It goes without saying that our title of the kingdom of God in the future, it's, it's a known fact. It's, a, it's something that will occur. There is a day on, on God's calendar, as you were, in which he will send the Lord Jesus Christ, as Acts 17, verse 30 and 31 says, that at these times of ignorance, God winked at or, or he overlooked, but in our commands, every man everywhere to repent. But why? because he is appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he hath ordained, and wherefore he hath given assurance unto all men in that he would raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. So there is a day in which this coming kingdom will come. And it's not just something that God has created or, or kind of made to go along um, as time has gone on, but from the beginning of the earth, when the earth was created, God intended to create the earth so that his creation could live on it for his own pleasure. Isaiah 45, verse 18, it says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens and the earth, God himself that formed the earth, he made it, he established it. He didn't create it in vain, but he didn't create it without purpose, and he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. So from the beginning, God created this earth with an intent and with a purpose, not just create it and leave it to go on like one of those um, things you wind up and off it goes. But he created it to be involved with it, to continue working with it. And so let's kind of expand that a little bit more. The purpose of the kingdom of God. Why is God setting up this kingdom on the earth? Well, essentially the kingdom is to fulfill the promises he made, as we've spoken about um, to Abraham and to David, but because it was God intention, God's intention from the beginning to create the world for his pleasure, but it's created to fill it with his glory. Now, there's many verses in the Bible, but just a couple on the screen to, to reiterate it, that Numbers 14, 21, as truly as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Future tense. Um, Habakkuk 2, verse 14, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And there's no water that doesn't cover the sea, meaning that the whole earth shall have God's glory from corner to corner, and all people will know of this glory of God. 
what is the glory of God. Now, I will not do any justice to this for, for time, time's sake, uh, but I suppose, let, let's start off with a simple point. Um, what is glory, the definition of glory? According to the Cambridge Dictionary, it's the magnificence or, or the admiration or great beauty of something. Therefore, what's the magnificence of God? What, what is it that we admire about God? What is the great beauty of God, especially as we don't actually see God? What's the glory of God? I don't actually have it on the screen, but Exodus 34, when Moses asks to see God's glory, what is said, unto, said to him? If we flick there to Exodus 34, we'll see the account where Moses asks to show me thy glory. But what does God actually show? Um, back in the previous chapter, chapter 33, verse 18, on the other page, he, he, Moses speaks to God and says, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And then the account continues until chapter 34, verse 6, and it says, And the Lord passed by before him, Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the children's children, even unto the third and the fourth generation. So when Moses asks, Can I see, Lord, show me thy glory, he gives a list of attributes, as it were. God, God's character. It's not really a character because God didn't develop them. These are what God is. So if the glory of God is his character, then. God's glory or his character and attributes will be shown in his creation. There, that be, that's you and I. And through his people wanting to follow him and be like his image. So for the glory to fill the whole earth will be men and women like you and I following the same character or attributes of our God throughout the whole earth. So this is very much a, a key fundamental thing that the glory of God is his character, and then he wants people to follow him and, and mimic him, manifest his character, and therefore giving him glory. A couple of verses I kind of want to look at to, to kind of put you and I in the situation. We've got um, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13 and 14. It says that God from the beginning hath chosen you to salvation. Okay, we've already talked about from the beginning God had this plan with the earth. But from the beginning, he's chosen you. That's you and I in this room here, reading the word of God to salvation. Now, this is very much a whole evening's topic, but salvation from sin and death. And because all humans sin, as they are the nature of Adam, they sin and therefore, because they sin, they die. So through, uh, from the beginning, God hath chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth Whereunto he called you by our gospel to obtaining the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if anything we know about the Bible is that the Lord Jesus Christ was a perfect manifestation, a perfect mirror image of our Lord, of God's character. And so if we are to obtain the glory of Jesus Christ, we are to therefore obtain the glory of God, the glory being his character. 1 Peter 2, verse 21 goes on to show this further, that um, for you who have been called, same language, talking about the same thing, because Christ also suffered for you, now it's going to the salvation side of things, but continuing, it says, leaving you an example that you might follow his steps, i.e. Jesus has shown us a way in which we might obtain that glory, the same glory that our Lord Jesus Christ got through the same character and attributes, through manifesting God. And one more verse, I want to, it's a passionate topic of mine, and if we haven't got time to go through it briefly, but Second Peter 4, 1, verse 4 and 8, um, which connects again to whereby we're given unto us exceeding and great and precious promises, those promises made to Abraham and David, that by these, these promises of this future kingdom, we might be partakers of divine nature, partakers of that glory or, or of the eternal life to come in God's kingdom, and having escaped the corruption, the corruption of sin and death, 
that is the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things be in you, these things of, of temperance or patience, kindliness, um, brotherly kindness and love, if they be in you and they abound, make, um, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful, i.e. You, you shall be fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to be fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ is to have the same glory. And that glory which shall fill the whole earth even as the waters cover the sea. So hopefully that has shown you what is the purpose of God's coming kingdom, or essentially what is the purpose of life, if you were, why God has created us on this earth. And if I've slightly lost you, let's come to something which we we very much well known out, um, out, in, out in general general knowledge, I suppose, is the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is probably one of the most well-known prayers, if not sections of scriptures that's found in Matthew 6, verse 9 to 13, that gives us a very much a, a very solid basis as to what the kingdom of God will be in the future. Even though people go through it, if you stop and think about it and actually realize what is said in it, it gives us a very good basis. So it starts off with, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So here we have, we are to pray for God's kingdom to come, i.e. it is not already here. It's not something that's within us or something that has come in the past and, and we are living in God's kingdom right now, but we're to pray for God's kingdom to come. Secondly, that thy will be done in the earth. Now, as we've literally just looked at, what is the will of God? To fill the earth with his glory. We're asking that God's glory be, be fulfilled in the earth as it is in heaven, which is God's dwelling place. So if God in his glory dwells in heaven, we're asking that that kingdom of God's glory be fulfilled on this earth, which he created for, our, for men and women like you and I to follow his character. It continues, give us thy, this day thy daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're ascribing the kingdom to God. We're, we're praying for that kingdom to come. We're giving, ascribing all power to him, giving the glory. We recognize that glory of God. And we're asking it again forever. Same language given as the promises to Abraham and to David. And what's God's intention with the earth? To fill the earth with his glory as the waters cover the sea. So it very much sets a foundational knowledge of what this kingdom is to come. It's a physical kingdom that will be on this earth in the future. And its purpose is to fill the earth with God's character, with his glory. Now, we very much looked at Israel's involvement um, in, in the past. And let's just do a very quick recap that this promises made to Abraham were to do with the land and a nation. And the land of Israel, which, which we know today, is the promised land which Abraham and his offspring who became a nation they inherited. And yes, that was partially fulfilled, we said. But they didn't hold on to it, um, at least through human failure. Their arrogance and disregard for uh, God's divine standards, they, it, they pulled it down and therefore God removed them from that land. He delivered them into the hands of the other nations and punish them several times over until the kingdom, when this promise shall be fulfilled forever. As Acts 1, verse 6 to 7, um, the disciples ask Jesus, Lord, will you not at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he says, it's not for you to know the times nor the seasons that the Father has fixed in his own authority. So we have this same cycle as the history of nation will happen again in the future. And that future... Israel, where we have, and we looked at this verse last week, Ezekiel 21, verse 27, it says, a ruin, a ruin, a ruin, I will make it. That talking about Jerusalem, and this also shall not be until he comes, that being the Lord Jesus Christ, the one to whom judgment belongs, I will give it to him. We had the first, so Israel's ruined three times. First time 
by the Babylonians around 600 BC, then by the Romans in 70 AD, and the third time will be just before the return of our Lord Jesus Christ to set up that kingdom of God on earth. And just like the other two times with the Babylonians and the Romans, he'll preserve a remnant, and God promises this. He will promise um, to Israel that he'll preserve them, that there'll be a remnant, as they are his precious people, which we looked at. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, he says, For I know the plans I have for you, declare the Lord, plans for, for welfare, not for evil, to give you a hope and a future, a future and hope. So God still is not done with his people Israel. And then Jeremiah 31, verse 35 to 36, uh, kind of reinforces this, that thus saith the Lord, he gives the light, uh, the sun for lights by day and the fixed order of the moon and stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that the waves roar. For the Lord's of hosts is his name. Now this is his promise. If these fixed order, order depart before me, those mean if the sun does not rise in the morning, it does not go down at night, if the stars and the moon don't come out at night, declares the Lord, then it shall be that the offspring of Israel shall cease from being a nation before me forever. The nation of Israel shall exist as surely as the sun rises in the morning and goes down at night. That is God, what God is saying. And I mean, there's a, there's a whole book on the miracle of the Jew that has lasted through years and years. We've had the, the Babylonian Empire, they rose, they, they went away. We've had the Romans rise and gone away. And the Jew has always been there. They've out, outlived them all. I mean, on a day on the street today, you don't say, oh, that's the old Babylonian. But you can still tell who the Jews are. And God has promised this, that there will still be this nation of Israel. So when we come to the return um, to God's kingdom in the future, it very much starts with the return of Jesus Christ. Now, the return of Jesus Christ, um, it, it's, again, a fundamental uh, teaching that the Bible teaches. Uh, Acts 1, verse 11, this is when the Jesus is transfigured up from the earth to heaven. It says that um, the angel speaking to his disciples, said, ye men of Galilee, why are you standing gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, the very one that you are seeing, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye are seen and go up into heaven. So there's the promise that Jesus, the same one that came 2,000 years ago, will return back to this earth in a day that God has appointed. A couple of things on this return. First, he'll be revealed to the believers who will be called to the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. Um, I kind of get ahead of ourselves, but I, I want to just focus on one thing. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry and a command, so another place that says that Jesus will return, and with the voice of the archangel, with the sound and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So, we have a resurrection there, that's the next slide, but we'll look at that in a second. But it's the, resur the dead in Christ shall rise first. So when Jesus returns, all the believers will be gathered together, including those who will be raised, which we'll, we'll have a look at it in a second, and they will first meet the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns. Then after, he will reveal himself to the whole world as um, in his glory and power and his might. In Zechariah 14, verse 3 and 4, it says that the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights in the day of battle. He will fight for the nation of Israel that will be in that third ruin in the time of the future kingdom. And on that day, his, Lord Jesus Christ's feet, shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem, and on the east of the Mountain of Olives it shall be split into from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half the mountain shall move northward and the other southward. This miraculous um, event shall occur that will reveal himself to the world and all the earth will know that the Lord Jesus Christ has returned as, as much as the lightning shines from the east to the west. So let's pick up this idea of the, the resurrection of the dead. Again, uh, we're going through so many fundamental principles of the Bible. It's found throughout, and we won't do it justice this evening again, um, but the importance and the significance and the meaning of the resurrection is key. Um, but for tonight, we'll just state facts to do with the kingdom of God in the future. Firstly, that the believers of Christ will be raised from the dead. 
as it's a Bible principle, it's throughout the whole Bible. Um, First Thessalonians 4, which is what I uh, just said on the last slide, um, a bit further along though, it says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep, in the dust sleep being um, the Bible's use of um, the believers who sleep or literally lie in the dust of the earth that are buried, uh, those which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Against, again, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Behold, I show you a mystery, Paul speaking to the believers. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed incorruptible to that immortal state in the kingdom to come. And this is one of the verses we looked at last week, that many of them which sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. But those that wake to everlasting life, they shall be wise, they shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars, again, forever and ever. It's the same language talking about this future kingdom to come. So let's just do a quick summary of what we've done so far to kind of gather our thoughts together before we move on. So, we state the Bible is the only source of knowledge that we can learn about God and His kingdom, and from that we have learned that God has planned to create His kingdom on the earth since creation, and that He has promised to fulfill this plan. Um, He's promised it to faithful men like Abraham and David. We've seen that the purpose of God is to fill the earth with His glory, that glory which is shown in the character and in the actions of His creation, i.e. us, you and I. And that Jesus will return to the earth and raise the dead, first revealing Himself to the faithful, the judgment seat, and then to the world when He saves His precious people, Israel, His treasured possession. I know the Bible is very much... Um, centralized in Israel, but we don't live in Israel. What about the rest of the world? The Bible doesn't talk too much on the rest of the world, but there's pretty much two responses to our Lord Jesus Christ's return. We have some nations will welcome the Lord. And Revelation 4, even though there's some symbology here, it shows that um, on the second line, it says that uh, they sit on the throne and worship him who lives forever, and they cast their thrones, thro- their crowns before his throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory, honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So there will be people or nations that will welcome the Lord, and they will (coughs) recognise him as the true creator, and therefore give the right glory and honour to him. Then we have those that will rebel and resist, and this is talking at the end of a, a, a thousand year period, um, but it says that the, these people that are one mind, they will hand over their power and authority to the beast, the beast being a, um, a group of people that do not agree with the Lord Jesus Christ returning and setting up this kingdom of God. For it says in the second line that they will make war on the Lamb, the Lamb, very much a symbolic uh, metaphor for the Lord Jesus Christ, but the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of Lords, and King of Kings, and those with him who are called and chosen and faithful. So we're even in this verse that will overcome these people that rebel against the Lord Jesus Christ at his return. Now we very much run through a very quick what happens from now for when Jesus Christ returns to what happens, but I want to spend the, predominantly the most of the rest of this night on what this actual coming kingdom looks like. After all, why do we want to be in this kingdom of God? We've got this own life as we have it now, the whole, we can get anything anything we want at a touch of a button, but we need to have a vision of what this kingdom is. We need to have a motivation for why we want to be in this kingdom. And as the proverb says, where there is no vision, that the people perish. um, And therefore, I want to go through how wonderful this time will be, this time that you will want, that I want to be there. Now, there's no real verses that go through it. We did have our wonderful reading of Isaiah 35, but I'm just going to go through several verses that explain about this wonderful kingdom. Isaiah 11, verse 6 to 9, it shows that there'll be no more hurt or destruction in the earth. 
you know, the classic picture is the, the lion and the lamb lying together, but actually Isaiah has it as the wolf shall also dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf with the young lion, and the um, faulting together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed, the young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the suckling child will play on the hole of the ass, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. Why? Because there is no more hurt nor destruction in all mine holy mountain. Again, we come to the same language, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So even nature itself, the, the earth that God created, will have this ordinance in which there will be no more destruction or hurt. In the kingdom, there will be um, the agricultural um, side of things will overplay, over, take over the war and they'll replace it, as My, Micah 4, verse 3 and 4 says, that he shall judge among many people, rebuke the nations that are far off, and for he shall say to them, that beat your swords into plowshares or your spears into pruning hooks. Those weapons of war, the spear and the, and the sword, shall be turned into plowshares and pruning hooks. They are tools for agriculture. Then not only will they not have any weapons, but it says, neither shall um, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So there shall be no more military at all. There won't even be um, people teaching the art of war because everyone shall be focused on the agricultural side of things. For it says that every man shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall be afraid. They shan't be afraid because there'll be no... No more hurt, no, no more, which was our last one, no more hurt or destruction. Not only is that in the order of nature, but it shall be also with man. For they shall sit under the vine and their fig tree, they will have plenty of their own, and they shall not be afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts have spoken it. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 and 4, 2 to 4, talks about Jerusalem as a centralized place for worship. It says that it shall come to pass in the last days. The mountains of the Lord's house will be established in the tops of the mountains, That's uh, indicating there could be a, a change of topography in the earth, that Jerusalem shall rise above, um, literally above the earth, and that there shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. All nations will want to go up, for in the second paragraph, or the verse 3, it says that many people shall go and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. They will want to go to the house of Yahweh, to, uh, to worship him in Jerusalem. They'll want to go um, to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. We saw how all the many nations, some that will welcome Jesus, some will resist him, but they will all get this re-education. Uh, for it says at the end of verse 3, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, so there'll be governance and judgment from Jerusalem. And that perfect judge will be the Lord Jesus Christ. For he says, <laughs> verse 4 kind of flows on, for he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks, same thing again. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So Jerusalem will become a place of worship and of education for people to learn about God so that they can walk in his paths, so they can follow him, so they can learn of his character. Walking in his paths is to, to walk in the same footsteps. You're following the Lord Jesus Christ's example. It, it's still showing us that that is the whole glory and character of God. In the kingdom, there'll be no more pain, no more death. Revelation 21, verse 1 to 4, And I saw a new heaven, a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. And Revelation means symbolic. It's kind of talking about ordinances. And there was no more sea, and I, John, saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he, God, will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. The Lord's Prayer. We pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. God reigns in heaven. He, he lives in heaven, as it were, because that's where his glory is. And because 
there shall be a complete perfection of his glory on earth, God will be able to dwell on the earth with man. And the last, verse 4, the last paragraph, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for these former things are passed away. And there should be no more pain, no more death, no more sorrow and sign, because it shall be a time of healing, as Isaiah 35, our, our chapter we read tonight, shows that the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, the lame man shall leap like an heart, the tongue of the dumb shall sing, and even in the wilderness water shall break out and the streams in the desert. There shall be no more diseases, no, no more destruction at all in this kingdom. And not only literally in, in, in mankind, but the earth will reflect this, as we saw in its increase in agricultural um, abundance. Let's go with. So much so that the abundance of fruit in the land, Psalm 72, verse 16, says that there shall even be a handful of corn in the earth at the tops of the mountains, even the places that you, you don't plant seeds. You, you try and put it in the, in the fertile crescents of places, uh, like volcanic rock and that sort of, or, or soil. But even in the tops of the mountains, the harshest of conditions, the earth shall be so plentiful that you'll be able to have a handful of corn, for the fruit, therefore, shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like the grass of the earth. It says, Isaiah 35, verse 1 and 2, that the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Uh, even in the outback of Australia, we'll have that blossoming of the rose and I suppose when you had the monsoon rains come through and you see those wonderful flowers, I imagine in my head that's what it would be something be like. But who knows what the Lord has planned for the continent of Australia. But it shall blossom and abundantly and even um, rejoice with joy and singing. And with all this, it, it culminates to this, this justice that God shall instate. It shall bring peace. As Isaiah 32, verse 16 and 18 goes on to say, that then justice shall dwell in the wilderness and righteousness shall abide in the fruitful field. And because there's justice and because there's righteousness, the effect of righteousness will be peace. And as a result of righteousness, quietness and trust forever. You won't have to worry about your neighbour stealing X, Y, Z because you've got your own um, blessings from God that he will bless the earth and multiply your fruit abundantly. Isaiah 32, verse 18, the ESV, it says that my people will abide in peaceful habitation, in a secure dwelling, in quiet resting places. There'll be no, no more of the turmoil or stress and worry about of this world. For we shall dwell, as it says, in secure dwellings and quiet resting places. Now, it's a wonderful time that is to come. It's a time that I hope you want to be there as well as I. But before we get to that, kind of coming back to these last days. The Bible talks about these last days in which, I suppose Daniel 12 verse 1 puts it very aptly, that there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time, that time when Jesus shall return. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. People Israel and everyone whose name is found written in the book, the book that God has, of all the faithful who shall be raised. But this time in these last days, it, it should be a time of trouble. Uh, and what does that look like? It's Matthew 24, verse 6 um, and 7, it says that you shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. And see that you be not troubled, for these things must come to pass in order for this time of uh, peace, abundance and justice in the whole earth. These things must come to pass but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes, and there shall be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. And you only have to turn on the news to see all these things occurring in the earth right now. And it's in these last days, in these time of trouble such as never was, that the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided um, um, in the midst of thee, talking to Israel this is, for I will gather all nations to Jerusalem against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished, and the half the city shall go forth into captivity. 
and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city because God has promised that he will keep them and he'll preserve them. And then, that is, we picked up this verse earlier about our Lord Jesus Christ's return, that the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So before we have this wonderful time, which we look forward to, there shall be a time of trouble. We see it in the world today. So do, do we know exactly when this time will be? Do we, do we know exactly when our Lord Jesus Christ shall return? Or not exactly. We are to live in anticipation of this day. 2 Peter 3, verse 3 to 5, it says that in these last days, some will lose faith and hope in the return of Jesus Christ because of how dire it will become. As it says in 2 Peter, knowing that um, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days, following in their own sinful desires. And I say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, the, the promise is made to Abraham, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And they deliberately overlooked this fact that heaven existed long ago and that the earth was formed out of water and through water and by the word of God. God created the earth for a purpose, as we saw. Its purpose is to fill it with his glory and because he wants to dwell with his creation on the earth. People will lose hope, lose faith of this. We have to live in anticipation and, and We've got to look at this from almost from God's perspective of timing. Further on in 2 Peter chapter 3, in verse 8, it says, But beloved, don't be ignorant of this one thing, that one day with us is with the Lord as a thousand years. And a thousand years is one day. God has existed since, I mean, at the beginning of time. The useless phrase that is for God, because we have time so, so um, wrapped around our own mortal heads that there is a beginning, there is an end, but God has been and will forever will be. What is, what is a thousand years to God in his timing? For he has set a day in which he will send the Lord Jesus Christ to return to the earth. And no man knoweth the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man shall return. So we are told to watch and pray. Matthew 24, verse 36, it says, Concerning the day of the hour, no man knoweth, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son of Man, as, or the Son. Jesus doesn't know when he will return. But the Father only, for as the days of Noah, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unawares of the flood that came upon them, and swept them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Uh, and to quote, uh, we had this at a Bible class recently, uh, Brother John Morris God does not tell his servants what is, um, sorry, God does tell his servants what has come to pass, but he doesn't give them all the details necessarily. He only gives them sufficient to keep them on the tiptoe of expectation. He also shows the disciple that prophecy is not just about prediction of when this time will be, for we're told, no one knoweth the day nor the hour, but it's about preparedness. We're not called to forecast precisely what will happen, to, but to be ready for when it might happen. Hence we are asked to watch and pray. Mark 13, verse 33, Take heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. And so with this wonderful day to come, we, we've, we've got to ask the question, what, what does our response need to be? How do we become a part of this wonderful kingdom to come? Uh, and so what, what, was, what must we do to be saved? Mark 16, verse 16 says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. So there's got an element of you've got to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, believe in this coming kingdom, that, that there is a day which God will send our Lord Jesus Christ, and we need to be baptized to be saved. And so about what is it just a, a baptism thing that we need to do to, to have this um, full body immersion? But no, we are... To, we are, how are we to live? Romans chapter 6, which is very often read at baptism, verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. So we're associating with our Lord Jesus Christ, trying to follow in his steps into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we are raised up and should walk in newness of life. 
that newness of life being trying to follow our Lord, to, to try and obtain that glory that our Lord Jesus Christ has through our character, through our, the moulding of our character to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what will give us, God give us in response? And this very much brings it all back together. Galatians 3, for as many of you has been baptised into Christ, you've put on Christ, you've associated with Christ, therefore there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, it doesn't matter who you are, what walk of life, you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The promise is made to Abraham that you'll be part of that seed, of that nation that shall fill the earth and and, in these shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Therefore, by being baptised, we can become part of the heirs of this promise, the promise of God's coming future kingdom. And so in conclusion, just to go through everything we've kind of discussed tonight, that there is a day that God will send the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth to set up his kingdom on this earth. And that the kingdom of God will be set up initially in Jerusalem and Israel, but it will expand to all corners of the earth. For all the earth should be full of the glory, even as the waters cover the sea. And this is in God's intention from the beginning. He promised that he will fill his intentions to fill the earth with his glory, shown in his creation. And this kingdom will be a wonderful time of peace, of prosperity, living on the earth, restored to its divine state as, as almost with the Garden of Eden. And all the earth shall give continual praise and glory to our God. And if we want to be part of this wonderful kingdom, we need to respond now, to believe, be baptised into the salvation that God has provided through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope I've shared with you this wonderful concept that the Bible shows from start to beginning, from start to end, and that you, like I, want to be there. Thank you.